Indie Mogul. Hey Indie Mogulers, Russell here. Welcome to Friday 101 for this week. Today we delve into the thrill a minute world of frame rates. The ones you're probably most familiar with are 24p, 30p, 60p, and 60i. The p of the first three meaning progressive, and the i of the last referring to interlaced. These are shorthand to describe the way in which each frame is captured. So let's start with progressive. When a movie is shot on film, they shoot at 24 frames per second. This is fairly straightforward. It's just 24 individual images taken by the camera and played back 24 times within one second. But video isn't made up of physical images, it's made up of data. And video, as originally conceived, was meant to play back at 60 interlaced frames per second, which we'll get more into later. But first, you may wonder why 24 frames per second is the standard when it comes to a film look. It became the standard playback rate for film all the way back in the 1920s, so a big part of this probably relates to the fact that our brains have been tuned to accept this look as film for so many years. When I was at film school, one theory explained to me was that the more frames that are added on top of that, like 30 or 60 frames per second, not only does the motion become smoother, but it makes it easier for your brain to process. By keeping film at a low number like 24 frames per second, your brain is forced to pay closer attention to take in the image than it would otherwise. Peter Jackson's The Hobbit was shot and is meant to be played back at 48 frames a second, and at a tech demo earlier in the year, a majority of those who saw it played back this way came away complaining that it looked more like TV than film. A lot of television is shot at 60i, which gives it its smoother motion. The interlaced frames it records are actually 60 half frames. Each image is made up of a certain number of horizontal lines. The video of this show, for example, has 1080 horizontal lines. In the case of 60i, the odd numbered lines are made up of one image, and the even numbered lines are another image. This creates what is called persistence of motion on a television set, which is made to play video this way and gives the illusion of more frames for a smoother playback. However, if you see this on, say, your computer monitor, you'll notice something strange. Computer monitors were meant for progressive imagery, not interlaced. So when you watch interlaced footage on your monitor, it handles this issue by showing two half images on one progressive frame. Let's go to camera two. This is my FX1 shooting 60i in HD. I'll give it the old John Cena, you can't see me, and let's look at the results. When we freeze frame the interlaced footage and look at the borders, you can see these jagged edges, which are more obvious with faster motion. This effect, which gives away the interlacing, is called combing. And if you've ever worked on a video with interlaced footage and uploaded it to YouTube without deinterlacing, you may have noticed a version of this. The truth is, you should always shoot progressive if your end game is to put a video online. Otherwise, you'll want to deinterlace your footage on the timeline. As stated before, computer monitors display images progressively. YouTube works the same way and does best with 24p and 30p files. Final Cut users can deinterlace with a filter built into the program, and with Adobe Premiere, you can right-click the video on the timeline and choose Field Options, Always Deinterlace. When I do that, let's play back the last shot in split screen and you can see the edges that are smoothed out. If you're working with a DSLR, you're lucky enough to get to skip all that deinterlacing. And from there, the most important thing is to keep everything consistent. I'm shooting this on my T3i at 30p, and therefore I make sure that, in my project settings, the sequence itself is also running at 30p. If I were to shoot 24p, I'd of course work with a 24p sequence. 24p already has a somewhat strobe-like appearance, which is associated with that film look. But it can appear too strobe-like if placed onto the wrong timeline. Here's 24p footage from our shoot for the Unstoppable Karate Master on a 30p timeline, and you'll notice that every few frames get doubled up to account for this. And when played back, it just doesn't look as good. That's the golden rule with frame rates. Keep them consistent from beginning to end for the best results. Now you may ask yourself, what about 60p, which many DSLRs shoot in so that you can achieve slow motion? For perfect slow motion, you have to do a little math. Quick, what percentage of 60 is 24? 40%. Play back the 60p footage on 40% speed on a 24p timeline, and that should line up perfectly. Since this video is in 30p, I'll play this back at 50% speed, and there you go. Works great. So to recap, interlaced footage is only good for television, and should be deinterlaced for playback on YouTube. 
Quick note, due to reasons having to do with refresh rates, 24p is technically 23.976 frames per second in video, which is what you're editing at in a 24p project. But when you output a file for YouTube, preferably with the H.264 codec, selecting 24 frames as opposed to 23.976 is perfectly fine. With 30p, just switch 23.976 out with 29.97 in that equation and it works the same. YouTube frame rates are whole numbers, but your editing software just likes making things complicated. And to avoid frame rate issues, make sure to keep things consistent from beginning to end. 24p footage means 24p project means 24p file. 30p footage means 30p, etc, etc, you get the point. And finally, perfect slow motion with DSLR footage just takes some easy math. That's all for this week, but I just want to give a quick note to those using basic editing programs, especially iMovie or Windows Live Movie Maker. They don't do 24p uh, the way better programs will, so if you're still only able to use free programs, let me once again point everyone to Lightworks, a free program at lwks.com that does 24p, along with a host of other options that many free programs don't have. It's daunting to go from a basic program to a more complicated one, but if you want to work with 24p, which I think is always the best option when actually shooting a movie and not a show like this, then it's worth the time and effort it takes to learn. Check out a few links that I've got for you this week. First, Michael the Mentor explains the history of frame rates. Then Nugget WRX's channel has a good split screen comparison of deinterlaced and interlaced footage. And finally, a tutorial on the basics of the Lightworks program, which, again, is a good idea for those of you looking to upgrade to a more complicated editor without spending a fortune. That's all for this week. We'll see you again on Monday with Griffin Hammond and his newest edition of Indie News. See you then.